I'm going to read to you this morning from the book of Acts, and the person who wrote that also wrote the Gospel of Luke, but I want to remind you of something that probably seems quite obvious in a way, and that is that there must have been hundreds if not thousands of other stories that could have been told or assembled and offered, preserved by the Gospel writers and the writer of Luke, but they chose particular stories because of the message that each story would offer you and me. It not only was a message that was going to be important to the present moment in the life of the church, but it was also they knew the kind of language and story and narrative necessary to carry the church forward into the future. It was helping to determine what the early church would look like. And so I offer you this reading from the book of Acts and ask that you listen for the word of God. Now the apostles who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. So when Peter went to Jerusalem, the circumcision party began criticizing him, saying, why did you go to the uncircumcised? And why did you eat with them? But Peter began and explained to them in order. I was in the city of Joppa, and I was praying. And in a trance I saw a vision, something descending like a great sheet. It was let down from heaven by four corners, and it came down before me. Looking at it closely, I observed animals, beasts of prey, reptiles, birds of the air. And then I heard a voice say to me, Rise, Peter, kill, eat. But I said, No, Lord. Nothing common or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But the voice answered a second time from heaven, What God has cleansed, you mustn't call common. This happened to me three times, and all was drawn up again in the heavens. At that very moment, three men arrived at the house. They were sent to me from Caesarea, and the Spirit told me, go with them and make no distinction. These six brothers accompanied me, and we entered a man's house, and he told us, how he'd seen an angel standing in his house and saying, Send to Joppa and bring Simon, also called Peter. He will declare to you a message. And by this message, you'll be saved. You and your entire household. So as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them, just as it had on us at Pentecost. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John baptizes you with water, but you will be baptized with, also with Holy Spirit. If then God gave the same Spirit to them, meaning Gentiles, as he gave to us when we believed, who was I that I would stand against or oppose God? And when they heard this, they were all silenced. They glorified God, saying, Then to the Gentiles, God has also granted repentance unto life. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. This must have been for Peter. Because the Jewish Christians in Jerusalem were followers of the way were criticizing or attacking his life, his work, among the Gentile community. Reports on his vision concerning all sorts of unclean animals and the voice of a spirit, leading him to not make distinctions, judgments, on the work of God or even what's clean and what's unclean. It's attacking, in a sense, Peter's 
kosher kitchen. This story is about the force of God's purpose, crashing against all established social protocols to make something new possible. And because they knew a bit about Peter's attitude toward the Gentile community, he was a very faithful Jew for synagogue attendance. He was a Messianic Jew in belief that Jesus of Nazareth was the Messiah, the Christ. They know, knew that he'd never baptized and certainly never baptized any Gentiles. That he kept the kosher kitchen, and to their knowledge, he'd never eaten with a Gentile. And because this is the person standing before them, bringing about this new revelation from God, for one reason or another, they were tempted to listen, to pay attention to what he had to say. It's been my experience, whether in the local church community, politics, anywhere in the world, where I've been and had contact with other people, religious people especially, I've noticed that theological reflection, looking at scriptures, embedding your heart and mind in them, and letting them speak to you, I've observed that theological reflection never preceded change. On the other hand, I've noticed that when your heart or when your mind changes on something, when God has, through the power of the Spirit, affected how you see things in this world, that it also affects how you hear and read Scripture and how you begin to interpret it. Those in the faith community were being asked to discern what is God doing in our time and in our place? And I think if there's hope for the church, and Chad and I spoke briefly about that last night at a wedding, looking for some prophetic word from the Protestant, from the evangelical, from the Roman Catholic community that invites us to see our scripture, our life together, our worship of God together in ways that are different and understand them to be a gift of discernment from the Spirit, then we need to be open to God's work of healing and reconciling in our time and place. In the mid-80s, I was serving a church that looking back on it, I've come to think of as probably the most prejudicial church I've ever served in my 47 years of ministry. I don't even know why they came to worship on Sundays. At best, we were 180 out. Whatever I said, I knew they really felt and believed the exact opposite. And there were occasions when people would tell me as much. I don't know how you can say that, Reverend. Well, it was my responsibility, my pastoral responsibility to speak truth, even to the powerless, and to those with power. After about a year or so of my ministry there, one of the members of the congregation developed throat cancer. And one Sunday, I just simply asked the congregation, he's going to need rides into Charlottesville. It's about a 45-minute trip. And I'd like for you to just let me know after church if you're willing to just drive him in so that he can get the radiation treatment. It's going to be about five days a week and for a number of weeks. And a few people signed up that same day. But later that afternoon, I had to go to the Harris Teeter. And there I was in this little grocery store when one of the parishioners who'd heard the sermon that morning called out my name, Jim, 
What is this you're arranging rides for this particular person? And he named his name. And what he told me was that he had particular difficulties with this person because of his sexual orientation. Oh, yeah. So I looked at him and I said, I'm going to call him Buck. That's not his name. But for the purposes of today's message, I'm just going to call him Buck. And I said, Buck, all I want to know from you is what days of the week you're willing to drive him to Charlottesville. <laughs> Silence. <laughs> but a few days later, I got a call from him. And he said, um, I'll take him to Charlottesville on Wednesday. And he did. After about a week to 10 days, he called up and he said, I want to take him every day. And I thought, okay, there's a, we usually want 80 out. But for some reason, we've come into some kind of spiritual alignment and this is a teaching learning moment and who am I to oppose God? I sort of withdrew back and I said, that is remarkable. Well, the two of them became fairly close friends. And within that year, the parishioner died of the throat cancer. And Buck spoke at his funeral. And in an autobiographical way, he confessed where he had been in this journey and how close contact and just learning to love another. Something happened in his life. It was a change of heart. It was a change of heart and mind without the scripture doing it for him. It was an experience that he had of just love. Of all of the people there that day, including the young man's mother, there were none any more expressing of grief than Buck. And the words that he spoke, they were true. They were honorable. They were filled with integrity, and the whole church saw it because they knew Buck. They had heard Buck in previous years, and now they saw before them a new person. It began to change that church. It began to change my ministry there as well. I think of John Wesley, and he's really not the one who thought up this notion of the quadrilateral. We give him credit for it. Albert Outler kind of stuck it together in its various components. But the Roman Catholics had a way of seeing it and understanding um, the interpretation of Scripture, not unlike this, and they'd had it for centuries, but sometimes it takes someone to package it together, and it came out uh, through Outler as Wesley's quadrilateral. That is to say, when you and I think of our lives as disciples of Jesus, and we want to do as disciples what we think God is asking of us as images of God and as disciples of Jesus. Wesley said, you're always going to have to start with Scripture. Snuggle up with it. Read it. Get to know God's Word. And let it, let it rest on your heart. Brood over it. Meditate on the words. But then to understand it, you're going to have to understand or come to terms or know or learn how the church has traditionally interpreted that particular text. So you've got scripture, and you're also sort of balancing it with tradition. How has the church itself, Protestant, Roman Catholic, Orthodox, Greek Orthodox, how have they understood this particular passage that you're reading in Acts? And then he said, and this really helps us a lot, you're going to have to bring to it reason. When you read the scriptural text, even when you come to understand how it's traditionally been understood, does it make sense? 
in your day and in your time and with everything that you've learned about psychology, sociology, human sexuality, you name it, the environment, geology, anthropology, with everything that you've learned, does the scripture as it has traditionally been understood make sense to you anymore? And if it doesn't, you've got to come to terms with it with a new mind and understanding. You've got to bring all of those disciplines into focus. That's a nice gift he's provided us. Reason. Does it make sense? And then he said, okay, there's one more. Experience. In the experience of your life, as you've come to understand people, to work with them, to have persons in your family who think differently than you or oriented differently than you, have your experiences, are your experiences able to help you understand these texts with new eyes, new ears, new mind, new heart? In the late 80s, the bishop sent me to United Christian Parish in Reston. And I was there about 10 years. And while I was there, I'd been there about a year, and we had one <laughs> incredibly marvelous woman. Her name was Mary Jackson. She had a gift for bringing new people into the church. I mean, she just exuded faith, love. She taught um, uh, yoga. Uh, to all of us who wanted to stretch a little bit and, and do it with her candlelight and the music in the background. Mary was just church people oriented. But she would constantly bring in someone new and introduce them to the congregation there at Reston that I served. One day she brought in a man whose name was Rinaldo. And he was probably uh, in his early 30s at the time. and, and um, we got on fairly well, but I noticed after about six months his attendance fell off. And I had just left that other church, and I thought, hey, is this a 180? Um, but I, what I found out was he was sick. And uh, when I mentioned it to Mary, she said, yeah, he could probably use a visit. So I went by to see him at home, and come to find out he had AIDS. His partner had left him. And I said, is there anyone who can sort of help you um, deal with this illness. He said, well, my family, they live in Norfolk and they've rejected me. They've pushed back. They, they've written me off. I'm not a son. And I said, well, the Spirit is speaking to me and what the Spirit is saying is to have contact with his family and give them an opportunity to, after I speak with them, to maybe rethink this relationship. So I called and I got his mother and I told her about Ronaldo's situation. About a week later she called, she had taken, a, she took a leave of absence and she came to live with her son in Reston and she stayed there with him and they reconciled their differences. She stayed with him until he died. And then she packed him up, went back to Norfolk with him, and buried him in the family cemetery, home again at last. Now, I've told you two stories this morning, but I know that you have stories too. And the way in which lives change are through the relating of your stories to others, to take the story of this Jesus of Nazareth, to take the story of persons who have loved you and you have loved in your lifetime, things have happened. And as you remember them and as you recall them, you have changed and you have probably been able to help change the lives of others. They're changed through the narration, the sharing of stories. What is your story? And I want to tell you that it has the power 
to change not only Peter and Paul, the disciples, Jim Sprouse. It's the way in which when you relate your own stories through your personal integrity and truthfulness, you can help Christ transform this world into his image. Because as a disciple, you're already bearing that image. You just need to think of wearing it with pride, with dignity, and with integrity. There's an old song that once went, we've a story to tell to the nations. And so you have. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.